Hello, everyone. My name is Davis. I am going to be running today's Facebook Live. Um, we have encountered many technical difficulties today, so give me 10 more seconds and I will have everything good to go. Okay, I think we are finally at a point where I can start this whole thing. So, my name is Davis. I work at the West Valley Outdoor Learning Center, and today, or today's Facebook Live is going to be about useful plants. Um, this is a topic that I really enjoy. I love being outside, and I love interacting with nature, and using plants is one of the best ways that you can do that. So. I guess I should start by saying, what is a useful plant? So, we are going to be talking about four types of useful plants. Useful plants are those plants that uh, are, are plants that can be used by humans for any number of purposes. Um, the four categories that we're going to discuss today are medicinal plants, edible plants, what I like to call craftable plants, and other. Um, so let's just hop right in. So. When it comes to medicinal plants, uh, medicinal, most of the, or um, most, many of the drugs that we use today are based on plants or have their origins in plants. Um, medicinal plants can be defined as plants that possess therapeutic properties um, or exert beneficial pharmaceutical, uh, pharmacological effects on the human body or animal body. Um, it is estimated that around 10% of medicine still used today around the world comes directly from plants. Um, so now I'm going to go over some examples of medicinal plants that we have here in Washington. Um, some examples are, first, I'm going to talk about stinging nettle. Now, if I say stinging nettle, you're going to say to yourself, why would a stinging plant possibly be medicinal? Um, and you would be right to think that. When you touch a stinging nettle, you are going to get stung. They have very little, they have tiny microscopic needles that inject a uh, very, very mild acid um, that cause the stinging and burning sensation. Um, but they have actually been used uh, in, medis in um, medicine for thousands of years. Um, and that sting is actually where their medicinal properties come from. So the toxin that is injected when you are stung by a stinging nettle has an anti-inflammatory effect that has been used to treat arthritis for centuries. Additionally, the plant has long been brewed into a tea that is not only um, delicious, personally, uh, but it is also very helpful for settling an upset stomach. Um, now, if you were to use stinging nettle to deal with arthritis, what people will do is actually whack their hand or whatever hurts with the stinging nettle to get stung by it and then embrace that anti-inflammatory effect. Whoops, sorry. Now, uh, now, the second plant I'm gonna talk about is plantain. That is this plant, the lower one over here. Oh, I can't. On the bottom. So, plantain is not to be confused with the precursor to the modern day banana. Plantain is often seen as a weed. It has these oval shaped leaves. Um, it has five to seven kind of veins running up them. Now, originally plantain was found in Europe and Asia, um, but it now exists all over the world. Um, and there are, I think there's seven species, but they can all be, they all have medicinal properties that can be used. So the plant has been used, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. The plant has been used for generations. Um, uh, let's see here, sorry, lost my, um, has been used uh, for generations to treat for um, bronchitis. So a tea can be brewed from the leaves of the plant um, that helps reduce chest in inflammation and uh, that is associated with bronchitis. Additionally, the plant can be chewed into a salve, so that is where you chew up the plant into almost a like goo, and then you can put that on a uh, wound or bee sting, and it helps to reduce pain and inflammation. I have personally used 
um, plantains to do just that uh, when I've been injured in the woods. So, um, Finally, we have this middle plant right here. This is called Devil's Club. So much like stinging nettle, people hear the name and they get scared. I mean, a plant called Devil's Club, are you kidding me? Uh, that sounds horrifying. <laughs> um, but it's actually, it, it is very painful to touch and can be dangerous if handled incorrectly, but it has very strong medicinal properties. So, um, Devil's Club has been used in traditional medicine um, for a very, very long time as an antibiotic. The stem and inner bark can be uh, ground into a paste which can then be applied to an open wound to help uh, prevent infection. In addition, the burned ashes of the plant, of the stems can be used to help prevent infection on burns. So if you burn the plant and then take the ashes and sprinkle it on a burn, now if this is a, like a third degree burn, you absolutely don't wanna do this, but if I'm talking about like a second degree burn with blisters or a mild first degree burn, it can help prevent infections there. If you have a third degree burn, you obviously need to get seek uh, professional medical care. Now, let's talk about edible plants. So most of the food that is eaten by humans around the earth is plant-based, with meat mostly being eaten as kind of a supplement to our, to our diet. Um, now, while some people believe that you should only eat plants that can be bought in the produce section of your grocery store, um, there are actually many common plants that are perfectly edible straight from the ground. So, edible plants can be described as this. Edible plants are those plants that are safe for human consumption or raw. Um, this, I should say, is not a guide for foraging plants. Um, before eating any wild plant, you should take proper care to make sure that you have identified it proper, or that you have identified it correctly. Um, there are many look-alike plants, um, so you don't want to, you don't want to do anything if you're not certain. So let's just hop right in. So again, there are many. So I'm only going to talk about a few that are in, that are here in uh, Washington. So first I'm going to talk about miner's lettuce. That is this plant down here on the bottom right side of your screen. It is a small leafy green that is very, very, very nutritious and it is very tasty. Um, it is a personal favorite of mine. So it is very easy to identify. Miner's lettuce is found all over Washington and you can identify it because it has these kind of heart-shaped leaves and little white flowers. Um, and then the leaves kind of alternate up the stem. Again, please do your own research before trying to go out and find this plant on your own. Now, miner's lettuce can be found all over Washington and it typically grows at the base of large trees and under bushes. Um, personally, I think the plant has a very similar taste to kind of a mild mustard, if that makes sense. Um, and the whole plant is edible, including the flowers and roots. So you can eat the stems, the leaves, the flowers, the roots, um, it's all good. Uh, so miner's lettuce gets its namesake from its use by California gold miners as a source of vitamin C and, a vitamin, and vitamin A. Um, the plant is supremely healthy, and according to a study by the American Journal, uh, or the Journal of American Diet, Dietic Association, 100 grams of miner's lettuce, about the size of a decent salad, contains a third of your daily required requirement of vitamin C, 22% of vitamin A, and 10% of the iron you need. When harvesting miner's lettuce, th see this is where you need to be careful. When you're harvesting miner's lettuce, the problem is that it looks very similar to a species of nightshade. It is a very mild species of nightshade, but still nightshade nonetheless. Um, so again, you want to be sure that you are identifying. Um, I see a question in the comments. If I see any of these plants in parks, are they safe to pick and eat? So miner's lettuce is perfectly safe to eat right out of the ground. Just make sure you're identifying it properly. Next, I'm going to talk about berries. Now, there are so many berry species in Washington that I could probably fill a whole presentation just with those. So I'm just gonna talk about one type. Um, I'm going to talk about bramble berries um, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about thimbleberries. So, 
Thimbleberries are another personal favorite of mine. They are also known as cowboy toilet paper, and I will explain that in a minute. Um, thimbleberries are a species of brambleberry, as I said, so they are similar to blackberries and raspberries and salmonberries. Um, they are unique in the brambleberry family, however, because their stems are not spiky. Um, they're not covered in thorns, and they are very soft. The leaves almost feel like velvet, which is where the name cowboy toilet paper comes from. If you can uh, use your imagination on that one. Um, this berry can be found in temperate forests, but it is also found, um, uh, and it is also unique in that it is not commercially cultivated. Um, this is due to the fruit being incredibly fragile. By the way, that's this ber berry up here. I did not point that out. Um, the fruit, kind of when you pick it, it almost falls apart in your hand. Um, so it would be very hard to harvest on a farm, for instance. Um, now, it tastes like a really, really sweet raspberry. I think they're very delicious. And if you go on any hike in, especially Western Washington, but you can find them over here too, um, you will find them all over the place. They have very large leaves too. The leaves are probably maybe about as big as my head. They're very large. Oops. Finally, we are going to talk about another interesting one, is the common dandelion. So this is one of the most recognizable plants in the world. The common dandelion is, surprisingly, fully edible raw. The flower, roots, and stems, and leaves and seeds are all edible. And this plant has been used in salads for generations, and the leaves are well known for being a delicious addition to any selection of greens. Now, something important to note is that this is not the only plant on the list that is not native, or that this is the only plant on the list that is not native to Washington. Dandelions actually originate in Europe, and it was brought over to the United States by European settlers. I would describe the taste of dandelions as kind of, it, it's very earthy, kind of like an earthy butter, if that makes sense. Um, kind of like dirt. They don't really have a very good taste, but they are edible and they are very healthy. Now I'm going to move on to craftable plants. So, I like to call them craftable plants. Some people call them wild craft plants. There are many different names for this category of plant. Um, but these are plants that have physical characteristics that make them useful to humans. So the definition I came up with is that craftable plants are, utilized, are plants whose parts can be utilized to build things. Um, there are many, many plants and, that are craftable, and this is not an exhaustive list. So, the first one I'm going to talk about is the cattail. That is up in the top corner there. Cattails are very recognizable. They're kind of the, um, I see another question in the comments. Has anyone used plants to make things before? We have. Uh, uh, there are many things that have been made out of plants, and I will get to some examples of that in a bit. So, cattails are very recognizable. They often are seen growing around ponds. They have the big, fluffy, um, hot dog looking thing on the top of them. Um, and they're often present in high volumes near water. So this plant is very fibrous and straight, and thus is very great for making cordage. Now cordage is another term for making rope, um, I guess is how I could put it. Cordage is rope or string that is made by weaving plant fibers. So the ropes that can be made from this plant are very strong, and if dried properly, they can be used to weave things like baskets or nets. Now, um, it's not even that hard, it's not that hard to learn how to do, and I'll explain how to do that in a bit. Um, I had six-year-old campers at my summer camp um, this last year, and they were able to make cordage out of plants. So, um, with very little training. Next, I'm gonna talk about the amazing cedar tree. Everyone loves cedar trees, I know I do. Cedar tree bark has been used by Native Americans for thousands of years as another source of plant fiber and building materials. So the bark, when stripped off the tree and crushed, can be weaved into cords, much like the cattails. Um, but it can, the bark itself is also very strong and can be used to make, it can be split into long, thin strips that can be used to um, 
you can weave them together to make baskets, uh, clothing, and all kinds of things. And then finally, the wood can easily be split and was used as siding on primitive houses. Finally, we come back to the humble nettle, again, one of my favorite plants. Again, as you can see, er, so, as you can see, nettles are very useful. Not only are they medicinal, they can also be used in crafting. So, nettles, if processed correctly, are known to have one of the strongest plant fibers on earth. Um, now, it is difficult to process the plants because of their stinging qualities, not to mention they have to be dry for an extremely long time. But once that has been done, the cordage that you can make out of it is second to none. Um, it is, I have found information online that suggests it's comparable to modern synthetic ropes. Um, the problem is that it takes a long time to process it, so that's why we don't see metal ropes. Here are some examples of some, uh, some stuff that has been made out of plants. So up here, where my finger is pointing, that is an example of cordage made from metal. Um, so a nettle plant may only be 20 inches tall, but there's a way to weave the rope together, just like uh, weaving yarn, so that, or, yeah, weaving yarn, spooling yarn, so that you can get a very long, strong rope out of that. Now, if you look at the image all the way to the right side of the screen, you can see that that is the process for making cordage. If you want to make cordage on your own, I highly suggest you go to YouTube and look up how to make cattail porridge. Cattail you can harvest almost anywhere in Washington, and it is very easy to follow a guide like that picture um, to make your own rope. I have a necklace that I made. I should have brought it. Um, I will post a picture of it on our social media um, that I made out of porridge. It is very cool. And then next to me, right here, is a skirt that was made out of cedar bark. As I said, cedar bark is very useful and it is very fibrous. It's also very flexible. Um, and it was very effective at making clothing for Native Americans. So, now I'm gonna move on to some plants that are useful in maybe some less traditional, less orthodox ways. Maybe not objectively useful. Uh, some of them are objectively useful. So, um, I guess it's just unconventional. They didn't fit into any other category, so they're worth mentioning. So first, I'm going to talk about the rare four-leaf clover. As you can see, way up in the corner there. Uh, the four-leaf clover has long been recognized as one of the luckiest plants in the world. Um, it is a species, this specific species that we commonly see is a species of white clover called Trifolium repens. Um, and the four-leaf variation is a rare mutation of the three-leaf common variety. It's estimated about one in 10,000 is a four-leaf clover. Um, now, the four-leaf clover was originally used in sorcery um, or uh, old magic, I guess. Um, and it was used to make potions that made the user happy, is what I found out about it. Um, eventually, that myth transitioned into a, the plant providing, uh, to the plant being more of a benel, oh my goodness, benevolent. 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 I'm not gonna say it today. I guess I can't say that word. Um, <laughs> It is a very nice plant, and it is said to provide users luck. Whether or not luck exists as an outside force can be debated, but um, it is said that the luck of a four-leaf clover is unmatched. So take that as you will. Next, I'm going to talk about this beautiful flower right here. These are yarrow flowers. Um, if you want to bring your bumbly friends to your yard, and I'm talking about bees, um, look no further than the yarrow plant. Uh, the flowers on the, I actually think it's a yarrow, um, are amazing at attracting bees to your yard, and they help to keep them very happy and very healthy. So if you want more bees in your yard, please plant those. Finally, we're going to talk about trees. Now, trees have many, many benefits for humans. Um, first, I guess most obviously, is that we use our trees for constructing things. Um, 
When you cut down a tree, you end up with timber, right? You get wood and, of many different sizes, and then other parts of the tree, such as the wood shavings, can be turned into pulp that can be used to make paper. Now, some other benefits of trees, uh, I guess most importantly, is that they remove carbon dioxide from the air. So carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that has contributed to global warming. Um, if we, and so when trees grow, they intake a lot of that carbon dioxide and use it to kind of, as a part of their structure. They break down the carbon and use it to build sugar chains that they use as their structure. So it's holding on to that carbon. Now, additionally, having trees around your house can lower the cooling costs of, uh, on your power bill. Um, the more shade that is applied to your house by trees, the less that you have to run your air conditioner, which we all, no one likes to pay their power bill and no one likes to pay a high power bill. So having trees around your house can help. And then finally, they clean air and water. So not only do trees sequester carbon, they can also pull certain toxins out of the air. Um, I know that sulfur dioxides, for instance, can be pulled out of the air by trees, and oils in the ground and different toxins in the ground can be pulled up into the roots. And then it doesn't hurt the tree. It'll, the tree will actually hold those in little nodules. Um, so it doesn't hurt it, but it also doesn't hurt the environment. Now, there is one more thing that I want to talk about today, and that is that plants make us happy in general. So results of multiple studies have shown that having plants going for a walk in the park or even looking at a landscape poster that has plants in it can produce psychological benefits um, such as reducing stress and improving concentration. Humans evolved in a we evolved in areas that had lots of plants around them, and since plants are so useful to us, being around, it was an evolutionary advantage for us to be happy when we're around plants. Now, we don't need to use plants to survive as much as we did when we were in our species' infancy, but having plants around your house can help keep you uplifted, it can help you deal with the stresses of modern day life, and it can, um, who doesn't like to see a nice house plant? Right? I have a beautiful firm in my house and it makes me very happy. Um, don't do what I do and get succulents though, they are very hard to take care of. And I have killed many. It's not even worth trying. Well, it's worth trying, but I'm not going to keep trying. Now, I would like, I know that this was a shorter presentation than we usually do, but please stay updated on our social media. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. Um, if you follow us on YouTube, you can see all of our past live streams. On Instagram and Facebook, we post all kinds of stuff, funny videos of animals, um, keep you updated on what we're doing with the community, um, and we post acts that we post events that we that we um, are doing. We also just started a TikTok. You can find it linked on our Instagram page. Um, I just got a question in the chat. Does the OLC have any cool plants outdoors? And yes, we do. We have a western red cedar out in the yard. We also have a couple birch trees. Something interesting with birch trees that's useful is that you can peel the bark off and use it as paper. It is not recommended though because it can harm the tree. We have, I have seen lots of different edible plants in the yard, um, including dandelions. And then we also have Oh, what else do we have? Oh, we have a large willow tree. The branches on willow trees can be used to make baskets. So that's also very cool. Um, so that actually leads perfectly into my final point. We are having a um, open house this weekend where you can come and experience all the cool stuff at the Outdoor Learning Center for yourself. Now, the in fact, the theme of this week's open house is nature connection. You will learn to connect with nature and how to maybe get a little closer to the outside world um, and learn to enjoy it a little bit more. There will be lots of animals out and you will get to meet and hang out with all of us. Um, again, please feel free to post any questions on Facebook, Instagram, 
Um, you can also email us. That is posted on our socials. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you guys so much, and we will see you next time.